As a society, we're inundated with depictions of pregnancy that emphasise femininity and womanhood. As healthcare providers, we aren't immune to this. Labour wards have women-only areas, and prenatal clinics have bright pink walls and signs saying, Mums to be, connect your urine pots here. There's only one problem with this. Men can get pregnant and give birth. In fact, it happens all the time. Hi, my name's Cass. I'm a registered nurse working in this A&E. This is the last film in a series dedicated to increasing the confidence and the cultural competence of healthcare workers working with trans people in specific areas. If you're not in healthcare, then by all means, please watch and share, but just know that we will wade into the weeds with some medical jargon. So, the group that we're talking about here consists of trans men, as well as non-binary people who were assigned female at birth, have a uterus, and reject in whole or in part the idea of womanhood for themselves. For clarity, we're going to use the term transmasculine or trans men to refer to all of these individuals. Many, but not all, will take testosterone or tea to masculinise their features, including body hair, their voice and fat redistribution. Some may have had top surgery, which is removal of the breasts. Some may have had lower surgery or bottom surgery, which could consist of any number of procedures to make their genitals look more typically male in appearance. A hysterectomy is the only procedure that completely precludes a transmasculine person from getting pregnant. This is only an introduction to trans maternity care and shouldn't be used as a substitute for expert, in-person education and referrals. I hope you'll finish this video with the confidence to look after trans people in your practice and the tools needed to seek expert advice when you think you might need it. In my day job, I rarely look after pregnant people. And so for this film, I've spoken to clinical experts and people with lived experience, and they've helped inform what we're gonna say here. And two of them have amazingly agreed to share what they know with you here. First, we'll hear about the medical considerations of trans pregnancy from Nathan, who's a trans midwife. We'll then hear about the importance of inclusive language in trans pregnancy from Jacob, who's an amazing role model and a papa of two. Let's talk about the medical considerations around trans pregnancy. Spoiler alert, most of it's the same. We all know where babies come from. And although many trans guys and non-binary people will have used assisted conception such as IVF or donor sperm, plenty of pregnancies result from sexual intercourse. While taking testosterone, there is a reduced chance of conception, but it's important for those taking it and healthcare professionals to know that it is not in itself a reliable contraceptive. In one study, 20% of people asked said that they conceived while not experiencing periods. It can be the case that even with a total lack of menstruation, people do ovulate and can get caught out. As testosterone is teratogenic or harmful to a developing fetus, it's really important that when someone finds out they're pregnant, they discontinue taking testosterone as soon as possible. While some people may experience an unplanned pregnancy while taking testosterone, most people will have stopped taking testosterone with the hope of falling pregnant. Frustratingly for us as professionals, but also for the trans community themselves, there is very little research on fertility after taking testosterone. But what we do know is that thousands of trans men and non-binary people have successfully conceived after pausing testosterone. This is something that rarely requires specialist medical support because once testosterone is stopped, a trans masculine person's hormone profile returns to the same as anyone else trying to get pregnant. Birth choices are very personal and this is even more important for trans people, particularly having these discussions early in pregnancy and giving the trans person time to really think about it. Many trans people have negative experiences of being in hospital and fear misgendering or mistreatment, so they may choose to have a home birth. Others may have strong feelings around physiological birth and therefore may choose to have an elective caesarean section. This could be for a number of reasons, including previous genital surgery or anticipated dysphoria around physiological birth. Having said that, in people who have had limited or no lower surgery, there's no reason to choose one mode of birth over another. It's about what makes the person most comfortable and the same considerations apply to them as anyone else. There's limited data available on the preference of mode of birth in this population, but it's important to discuss early on the realities of giving birth. Being a trans person who anticipates potential dysphoria is a completely valid reason for informed elective caesarean birth. There is no inherent requirement for a trans birthing person to have consultant-led care. The times that someone could need to be referred to an obstetrician are 1. A lengthy overlap of testosterone use with pregnancy. 2. Many forms of lower surgery, which doesn't necessarily prevent physiological birth, but is a consideration. 
or three, knowing from booking that they want a cesarean birth. When you book a trans pregnant person, consider if there may be any of your colleagues, midwives or obstetricians who have experience or knowledge in trans pregnant care and consider referral to them. This may be more appropriate for the trans person. Consider referring to any team that could offer continuity of carer. This is particularly beneficial for avoiding misgendering and improving care. But patient-centred care is of course important, so please don't make these referrals without discussion with the trans person first. If someone hasn't had top surgery, they have the same potential to feed their baby from their body as anyone else, regardless of whether they've taken testosterone in the past. Depending on comfort levels with their chest, a trans person may wish to feed their baby from their body as much as they can, and so it's worth referring to a lactation consultant as early as possible, possibly even in pregnancy, to give them this support. Many individuals will choose to continue testosterone after giving birth. This will be done with the support of a specialist and with consideration to dosage and any impact on infant feeding if the parent is chest feeding. There's limited and contradicting evidence about whether testosterone is harmful to a chest feeding newborn. So if a parent wishes to nurse their baby, they should be counseled to make an informed decision about this. We can reasonably assume, like the vast majority of medications, that only a very limited amount of testosterone would actually cross the blood to milk barrier. And therefore, it is likely that the benefits of feeding a baby human milk are likely to outweigh any potential risks of taking testosterone while feeding. Sometimes a compromise may work. For example, in one case study, the birthing parent decided to chest feed for a couple of months, and then when they were ready to start taking testosterone, they discontinued chest feeding. As healthcare professionals, we should be mindful of these conflicting issues and also be aware of how to identify and treat potential androgen exposure in a newborn. There are still lots of unresolved questions in this area, and as with all areas of caring for trans people, high quality research is sorely needed. Historically, there's been an assumption that everyone with a uterus identifies as a woman, but even within the field of obstetrics, that's just not true. Historically, there's a famous case of a surgeon who was the first person to perform one of the cesareans where both the parent and baby survived, and he himself was a trans man, who was not only working in obstetrics, but had also given birth himself. It was only after his death in 1865 that James M. Barry was discovered to have been assigned female at birth. Although, of course, that wasn't the language used at the time. It's easy to believe that trans people are a new phenomenon, but we've always been here. We just now have language and ways of connecting that didn't exist before. And language is incredibly important. Without language, we can find that we're not able to articulate what it is we need. And with the wrong language, that acts as a barrier to us accessing care. When talking about perinatal services, this has become a bit of a sticking point, both talking to individuals, but also looking nationally and the media representation around this. But it is entirely possible to include trans people and still centre women. If someone is a woman, a mother, and she's breastfeeding her child, it's really important to use the language that's correct for her. And also that's something to be celebrated. It's wonderful. In that same vein, I'm a trans person. I'm a papa. I'm a birthing parent and I chest fed my babies. One of the things that was really useful for me was having the opportunity with my midwife to talk early on about what language I use for my body. That helped me feel safe and able to talk to her about birth and pregnancy without waiting for something to trip up. A tool that can be really useful for this is a body map. And that's something that isn't just useful for trans people, but for trauma survivors or anyone that uses different language for their body. Antenatal classes are incredibly important, but it's something that I, as a trans person, felt very uncomfortable accessing. But this is a really good opportunity for you as healthcare providers to look at other ways of providing individualised support. What can be really useful and was useful for me is having access to one-to-one -to -one space to talk with a midwife about birth choices. Finally, what I hope you take away from this discussion once you peer past the exaggerated headlines and shouting matches over the trans debate that there are things to learn that can benefit both women and trans people. Thanks guys. For myself as a healthcare worker, it's really clear that maternity, probably more than any other speciality, has some deeply entrenched gendered language that's sometimes used reasonably, but sometimes can cause real harm. It can be so hard to change something as fundamental as our language in our daily working lives, but consider the impact that it can have, both on the service as a whole and as your trans patients as individuals. If we're told that someone prefers different language for their body, then it's our duty as holistic care providers to use it. We already do this for a lot of our service users. 
People have all sorts of names for their own vulvas, and we often just mimic them without even thinking about it. To go further, why not think about which terminology you can introduce into your practice and facilities? Can you replace or add to the term new mother with birthing parent in your hospital signage and in the written material that you provide? Why not do it? It's more inclusive, and as I'm about to share with you, it saves lives. In a recent study, 30% of trans and non-binary people surveyed said that they didn't access either prenatal or even NHS support during their labour. This rose to more than 46% for trans people of colour. These figures are comparable to the rates of antenatal care access in some of the most deprived areas of the global south. We know that this correlates with infant and maternal mortality. This is a powerful and a terrifying reminder of the kind of alienation that we contribute to and the real effects that it has on our service users. I want you to remember that next time you see a headline like this. Through this series of films, we've discussed how excluding trans people from the NHS services that we all have the right to access to results in real harm. This is on us and we need to be better starting from today. Please share these films with colleagues, incorporate the information that you've seen here into your policies and your guidelines, and above all, practice positively. We all share a duty of care, and this is one area that we continue to fail in. If nothing else, I implore you, both as a registered nurse dedicated to evidence-based, inclusive and effective care, and as a trans person who has had my fair share of horrific healthcare experiences, to engage positively with the trans community. Thank you so much for watching.